Hello everyone, this is the second video I wanted to upload on the subject of these Krantara miniatures that I finished recently. They are government infantry uh, for the 1745 Jacobite Rebellion and I've painted them up as Barrels Regiment, the 4th Regiment of Foot, which uh, fought at Culloden. And Last, on the last video I, I showed you the figures in more detail but uh, as I said then I wanted to also talk about uh, my learning curve really on how I went about painting them and the uh, colours and details that I chose. I, um, this, this is the first ever kind of regular British infantry I've painted for the 18th century. Uh, painted Napoleonic figures in the past and uh, thought really that I was going to be able to uh, sail through it really and it wouldn't be too difficult a task but in fact it turned out to be a really complex subject and I just wanted to describe my learning curve really and maybe it'd be useful for people who are going to paint figures for the, that period, the 1740s, so it's basically the war of the Austrian succession and the Jacobite Rebellion, a few other um, colonial conflicts that took place at the same time, but there the uniforms would differ from the um, uh, the climate and so on, would have, would have affected the way the troops dressed. So it's principally the war of the Austrian succession and the Jacobite Rebellion. Um, yeah, right. So, I, as I say, I thought it was going to be pretty easy. Uh, I, I, I don't know why I imagined that, because when you think about the Napoleonic Wars, um, whatever, if you, if you have painted figures for that period from, say, 1793 through to 1815, whatever the nationality of the army, you'll, you'll, notice, you'll have noticed that there were quite a few uniform changes just in that short period alone. Um, in, um, if we give you some examples in the British Army, um, by the time of Waterloo, they'd switched to the Belgian Shaco rather than the Stovepipe Shaco. Um, although there was one regiment, I forget the number, that did still wear the Stovepipe Shaco at Waterloo. Uh, the Russian Shaco changed over the period. Um, the Austrian helmet changed, the uh, um, French uniforms changed dramatically from one end of that period to the other. So, you know, I, my previous misconception was that the 18th century, the only difference really was that they wore tricorn hats and that was about it and nothing much altered from you could use these figures to fight the Seven Years' War or maybe even the American War of Independence. Um, totally wrong. Uh, so I wanted to sort of talk a bit, little bit about that. I started off um, again not very well equipped in terms of reference material. Um, I had a number of Osprey books that I got because I, I um, began by painting up some Highlanders. So several of these books just deal with the Highlanders so they're immediately going to be um, not much use to me. Uh, this one as well and then um, I had uh, this book which is interesting but of not much use in terms of um, getting uh, ideas of uniform details although it does like this other book that I had here a moment ago it does feature on the cover the famous painting of um, Moria, he was a Swiss artist, he painted this, well there's a bit of discussion about it, but it was certainly no earlier than 1748 and was probably painted around 1751, so several years after the after the Jacobite Rebellion. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, then I also had uh, these books which were of more relevance, Cumberland's Culloden Army, uh, the Jacobite Rebellions 1689 to 1745 and that includes plates of both Jacobite Highlanders and um, government troops. So there's a few things in there. In particular, 
there is a, a plate featuring the drummer for a drummer from Barrel's Regiment. So that is um, directly relevant to what I needed to find out. And uh, also had this book here, Cumberland's Army, the British Army at Culloden. Um, more well, it is good for uniform details. There's a few colour plates and so on in here, um, such as this one and some photographs of a reenactor uh, but of kind of like limited of, of limit li less less useful i found than the other than the, these other two books um so my first so that was where i started really um uh, and as you may remember i stumbled quite early on because um as i understood it the Barrels Regiment was, was a royal regiment and that meant that the trousers uh, for royal regiments were blue rather than red. And this, this is a plate from the clothing book of 1742 showing a hat man from Barrels Regiment. And as, as I you know, discussed on a video several months ago, um, it was a bit unfortunate that it was in black and white because that picture by Morier, which is meant to represent Bowles Regiment, um, clearly shows um, an officer, I believe he is, wearing a red pair of trousers. So I was fairly confident that they should have been blue, but... Um, you know that kind of thing through doubt in my mind so it held me up for a little while but they are definitely definitely blue and since then i have acquired a reproduction of that 1742 clothing book so i was quite glad to get hold of this it's a fantastic piece of reference material um, so basically, I'm going to come back to this subject in a little bit later about the reason why there was a clothing book. Um, but just to show you that every regiment is represented in the British Army with the hat man and the colours of the facing colours and the lacing and so on. Um, and here is that same plate that I just showed you, but in colour, definitely blue trousers. So. Um, I was off and running. The next um, problem I came to, however, was in one of those, uh, this one here I think it is, Cumberland's Culloden Army, there is, a, there is another plate showing a hat man from Bowles Regiment there. Um, it wasn't of any use to me in terms of fixing my dilemma about the trousers because he's facing away from the uh, the viewer um, but I thought that gave me all I needed to know uh, to carry on painting the hat man and the other thing that I hadn't realized about this period was that I had assumed that the lace was just white um, but it's not if you if you actually look I'll keep it so it's in focus yeah I think you should be able to see on the camera that isn't white lace that isn't white lace around the sleeve um, it's white yes but it has a blue zigzag pattern um, running all the way through it now that was fine in terms of I knew to try and represent a blue zigzag on my figures not easy to do on the thinner areas of lace but you, you can just about i'm not particularly good painter of fine detail but i did sort of like squiggly blue lines along in a transparent kind of colored blue so that it didn't look too heavy against the white and i managed to kind of get some kind of representation of blue zigzag lines on the lace um but of course that was specific to Barrel's Regiment. So I then began to wonder, well, how on earth am I going to be able to um, discover what the, the particular lace patterns for um, all the other regiments were going to, going to be? Because they were regimental distinctions. And at that time, I didn't have this 
um, this book. I've only, only just got this last week. Um, and that would have given me an idea. Um, although it's not actually written down, it's just something you have to perceive in the, in the diagrams to work out what it is. Um, I then realised that um, I'm sitting on this really kind of valuable resource that I've, I've spoken to you about in the past on other subjects, which is um, I've got the entire set of uh, military illustrated uh, magazines from when they began in 1984 right through to when they um, wound up several years ago. And um, what during the first lockdown, I actually um, went through all these magazines and index them so that I can I can you know get sort of uh, reference material far, you know is at my fingertips rather than having to sort of like thumb through all of them and ever since then I have found this a really useful source of information and lo and behold in one of these I just have to, um, yeah this one here So this is an article here, specifically on what the British Army wore at Culloden. You know, when, when, this, when this magazine was issued, it comes from 1996, I would have just sort of skimmed right through that because it wasn't a subject that had particularly interest in at the time and, and I just sort of forgot it was there. But it's absolutely ideal because um, not only has it got quite nice colour plate there showing another hat man um, from the second Royal Regiment so again you can see Royal Regiment blue trousers um, but it has details for every regiment that fought at Culloden so not every regiment in the um, British Army but it's got something for every every regiment at Culloden describing what the lace pattern was for each regiment so there you can see fourth barrels blue facings white lace with blue zigzag square loops and ladder pattern on sleeve. Now that is something else um, that I wanted to kind of mention at, at some stage. So I might as well talk about it now. Um, I'm not by any means a sort of button Nazi or anything like that. So I'm not approaching it from that point of view. But if you were to be really pedantic about uniform details for this period, um, there are a number of things that varied apart from colour, um, colours and, of lace and colours of facings that varied from regiment to regiment. And one of them was the pattern of the lace going up the sleeve. So this is an example of a ladder pattern, but there you often get a herringbone as well. Now, um, that makes it very difficult for a figure manufacturer um, like Krantara, who produced these really kind of um, beautiful detailed sculpts. Um, because they have to make it, they they have to make a decision on um, how they are going to represent the lace pattern on the sleeves. So they have gone entirely for ladder patterns. Um, so a real pedant, you know, if you're going to if you're going to paint up a a regiment that that had the herringbone pattern, a real pedant is is going to possibly pick you up on that. Um, it's just something that you have to live with. You know, it do, it doesn't worry me as I say. I'm not. I'm not sort of a button Nazi in any, or rivet counter or any of those things in any way, shape or form. But I do like to try and get things, you know, as close to historically accurate as I can. Um, it bugs me if I discover a year after the painting a figure that I've painted the wrong colour here or there. And, you know, it always niggles at my... Uh, conscience, I have a little guilty feeling about it. So, as the the the, the most the, the, you know I can get right at the time of painting, the better really, um, and then I can you know rest content. And if I have made a mistake, or if there is a a mistake that is unavoidable like that, you know, on a on a figure, then I'm perfectly happy to live with it. Um, but I do like to try and get things right at the beginning. So. Um, as I say, yeah, I, I was up and running with uh, Barrel's Regiment by that point, and I discovered these um, various articles in Military Illustrated that were going to help me. Um, there's a couple of others 
in here that I'm going to come back to later about uh, the making of the red coat. So there's two articles I found on the red coats. So there's there are other examples of nice um, illustrations from this period. So this article not really relevant to uh, much to what I'm talking about at the moment, but I just thought I'd show you it out of uh, interest because this is an article on the defence of Ruthven Barracks by Sergeant Malloy um, that uh, Terry Crick has been uh, discussing on his channel recently. He, he was up in Scotland and visited these barracks um, and you know I thought it was interesting to find this article um, not only because it's got some good illustrations here of typical kind of dress of uh, soldiers of the period. This is Sergeant Malloy sp specifically, but also because it's an interesting story about the siege. I I I, I sort of hadn't realised that. I, well, I knew I knew from Terry's description that Sergeant Malloy had held out in this barracks f um, for a siege with only like about ten to a dozen men, and I thought, how on earth, you know, did he manage that? Um, but um, the first, there were two sieges, and and he did uh, surrender the garrison um, after the second siege, and that was because there was a village about where this camera, about about here somewhere, about more or less from where the um, camera angle is, and on, during the second siege, the Jacobites brought up um, artillery. Put it in the village and began to kind of bombard the the garrison um but in the first siege they didn't have artillery it was a fairly um hastily prepared attack and what sergeant malloy did most of the garrison of the barracks had been stripped and he was only left with you know he was in in command and he was only left with about 10 men so he split them up into two small groups and placed them in the bastions and there are two bastions one at in sort of diagonally opposite corners of the of the fort and the other two sides are dominated by these really high garris, uh, garrison blocks um, you know so the access to the barracks was through the main entrance on that side and a sally port on the other and um, from those from those block houses he would he had a kind of controlling fire and covering fire over both the entrances so this is the sally port entrance and what the jacobites tried to do was to bring up um some barrels of gunpowder and and uh light a fuse and and run off and um you know wait for the door to blow open um and on the other side there was a single person with a ladder trying to um, while this diversion was going on on this side, trying to put a ladder up against the wall and get over it, but he didn't even get the ladder up as far as the the front entrance. And that was because from both blocks, they had this controlling fire over the entrances and were able to shoot the attackers. And once the, the barrel was um, put in place and a fuse was lit, but Malloy and a couple of a couple of other soldiers just came along this rampart here and poured water over it to extinguish the fire so that was that was how he successfully managed to defend defend the barracks the first time around but as i say the second time um you know he gave, he gave quite reasonably gave gave in because of the artillery um anyway enough of that let's get back to um talking about the uniforms so I also, during the course of the painting, got hold of a lot of other books on eBay that came in very useful. This one is the Warrior series from Osprey, British Red Quote, 1740 to 1793. And I got the three copies of King George's Army, 1740 to 1793. Um, they cover various wings of the army and so on. Um, the most useful books I found were one and two. Um, what I wanted to do next though is just before I go into some more of the specifics about the uniforms and what I found out is just to go back to the Military Illustrated and 
talk about another kind of um, misconception I had that um, was corrected by an, a couple of articles, not just one, in, in Military Illustrated. So this is a this is an article on the making of England's redcoats, and reading through it, I was I was interested to sort of read. Um, an opinion really but it's it's quite a convincing one about why the British Army or any army so that for that matter national armies adopted uniforms towards the end of the 17th century so for instance in Britain there was a civil war in the um, middle of the 17th century as you all know, Cavaliers and Roundheads and all that kind of thing. Um, but both sides tended to favour red as the colour of their uniforms. And, and also they tended to um, develop uniforms for their armies. Prior to that, um, there hadn't really been any um, cohesion or, or uniformity, literally uniformity, in the, in the style of clothing that armies wore. And I had always assumed that uniforms were worn to distinguish one side from the other. Um, in the case of the Civil War, that clearly can't be the case because both sides were tending to favour the red colour. What it is more about, what the, what the adoption of uniforms is more about, is actually instilling in the unit an idea of uh, cohesion and working as a unit rather than as an individual. And of course this is particularly important once you get um, the adoption of weapons such as the musket and pike and so on that require an awful lot of drill. They require the entire unit to, to work as one um, in terms of loading, firing and so on, or the way they're presenting their pikes. And uniforms were thought to be um, a sort of psychological aid to that, to that process of drilling troops. Um, it was meant to give the troops a, a, a feeling of belonging to a unit of which they were sort of one small element but the whole unit had to work in unison in order to be able to function um, adequately on the battlefield so it was commanders like Cromwell and so on who who were seen as successful com as successful commanders because they drilled their armies so effectively that they were able to operate far more efficiently on the battlefield and it was actually numbers didn't matter so much as um, experience drill um, and the uniform came into that um, the reason both sides chose red um, was that when you think about the colors that were available for uniforms there's a whole piece on on it in here um, in the sort of ancient and medieval periods, um, natural dyes uh, were all that were available. Really, the sort of synthetic dyes didn't come come in until a lot longer after after this period. Um, so this this author, I uh, forget who it was, now, George Green. Um, he, he sort of gives you a list of kind of colours and dyes that were available to um, the sort of pre-industrial era armies um, or uniforms or clothing of any kind. Um, so obviously there's woad, uh, which we're all familiar with, um, which can give you either a kind of blue or a greeny like colour. Um, then there's the, ma the, the madder root, which is red. Um, oak tannin and walnut husk which can give you dark brown onion skins can give you yellow or brown green weed and the flower heads of reeds can give you green elder bark and meadowsweet can give you black and up until the middle of the 17th century sorry for knocking the camera that is really more or less all that was available and then at about that time um, a lot more madder Route becomes available um, 
uh, and that's mainly got from Europe. Um, but there's also indigo that's coming into the equation, um, which gives you a blue blue dye, um, and that's being produced in the in the New World, in the Caribbean, and so on. Uh, and obviously, as empires begin to expand and colonialism, the era of empires develops, um, a lot more indigo becomes available. So the the primary kind of colours um, that are going to be suitable, uh, they're going to be available are red and blue and the reason why so many armies in the 18th century are either red blue or white is that those those are the um, colors that were most easily produced in cheaply and in large quantities if you're going to produce another color like like green then the dyeing process is going to be more convoluted. You're going to have to go through two dyeing processes. So, for instance, you would um, dye something yellow and then blue to produce a green. Um, if you wanted to make something orange, you'd have to dye it red and then yellow and so on. Um, so that's a sort of double stage process. So a lot of armies in in Europe are either red, white or blue. The reason white is easy as well is that it's just undyed or bleached um, clothing. It's, it's So it hasn't got a dye in it at all and it's just the natural colour or it's been bleached to take out any sort of greyness in it so that it appears white. Um, so that is really the reason that we ended up with kind of a red red uniform as being the traditional uniform of the British Army right through to the Victorian era. Um, could just as easily have been blue, um, but red red was kind of common uh, common common colour to be able to get hold of. Um, yeah, I think I'll skip out the, 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 the actual process of... Uh, oh, yeah, no, let me read it out to you. The, the, the process of actually dyeing is pretty um, disgusting. Um, I'll, I'll read it out to you rather than try and abbreviate it, praise it. The traditional process of dyeing began with the cloth itself. A raw fleece was first cleaned with human urine to remove any grease or dirt. This was one of several processes in which human urine featured as a vital ingredient and in the past urine would never be thrown away but stored in buckets at home and in public places such as pubs where it would be sold to the urine collector sometimes known as piss harry who would then make a comfortable living selling it onto cloth manufacturers william partridge in his practical treatise on dyeing in 1823 described its qualities Urine that is fresh voided will not scour well. That from persons on a plain diet is stronger and better than that from luxurious livers. The cider and gin drinkers are considered to give the worst, the beer drinkers the best. When urine is collected, it should be kept in close vessels, that means closed vessels, I think, until it has completely undergone those changes by which ammonia is developed. <clears throat> and then after cleaning, the raw wool was then carded, that is the fibres brushed to remove tangles in redness for the process of spinning and weaving into cloth. Raw cloth was taken to a dyeing house where it would be soaked in water and full as earth, a high absor highly absorbent clay used to absorb more grease from the cloth. With washing, shrinking and beating or pressing, the cloth would increase in weight and bulk, becoming fuller and was now ready for dyeing. A recipe for dyeing, 60 pounds of wool scarlet, recorded in Partridge's Treatise of 1823, lists one pound of cochineal, which is powdered American insect, three pounds of madder, six pounds of argol, which is a deposit from fermented wine, three pounds of alum, which is a metal sulfate used as a mordant to fix the colour, four pints of tin liquor, derived from tin, a mordant used especially for creating scarlet, six pounds of cup bear which is a rock lichen found on the sea found by the sea rather and two buckets of urine the alum argyll and tin liquor was boiled together in a vat for half an hour then the madder and cochineal added for a further 10 minutes the wool was now added and boiled for two hours in this liquid which was then run off and the wool cleaned a fresh liquid was made of six pounds of cup bear and two buckets of urine and the wool plunged into this for another two hours. 
Dyed and cleaned, the scarlet cloth was stretched over tent racks and left to dry outside. It was then combed with teasels, originally the bristly head of a flower, to create a nap, a soft fuzzy texture on the cloth. Lightly rolled, the cloth was finely immersed in hot water to give it a permanent luster. Thus was created the scarlet cloth of the British red coat. Um, so if you wanted to do that, if you wanted to mix all that up, um, you would actually presumably get um, the perfect colour for the British uniform, which we, you could then reproduce in your in your paints. Um, anyway, enough of that. So at the beginning of the 18th century, um, originally clothing units had been the responsibility of the commanding officer. Um, with the kind of adoption of of uniforms, um, it became a kind of natural uh, process for the for the government and for the army as a whole, as a body, rather than individual commanders to supply the uniforms. But the reason you have regimental distinctions is that the, the, the sort of finer details, not the red of the uniform, but the finer details like colour facings and so on, were still a kind of um, a relic of the, the days when commanders chose their um, chose their own sort of un uniforms and colours, you know, their own individual preferences. Um, so it's only kind of over the course of time that that becomes a regulated uh, issue as well. So it's slowly developing um, towards the end of the 17th century and the beginning of the 18th. And then, of course, you have the Marburian period. And the, the Duke of Marlborough, again, is another one of these commanders who um, a lot of his success stems from the way that he, he um, disciplined the army, drilled his army, and also regulated it in all kinds of areas like, um, you know, wagons for um, standardization of wagons and wagon wheels and so on for the supply of of forage and also so he you know they begin to, the army begins to step in to taking over control and supply of the uniforms so you get a sort of a payment uh, a, a sort of quartermaster sort of uh, organization um, that begins to pay for the uniforms but you also get another one another uh, department which begins to kind of describe in a lot more detail um, what the uniform should be so that once it's contracted out to um, clothing suppliers um, then there is a sort of template against which um, the produced uniform can be judged to see whether it's suitable for the particular regiment to wear and this is where clothing books come in so there wasn't just clothing book in 1742 I mean it's extremely useful that uh, there was because it's very close to the period that I'm interested in wargaming 1745 rebellion um, there are a number of clothing books throughout the 18th century it just so happens that the 1742 clothing book um, was re what's the word sort of redrawn um, sort of resurrected and, and reproduced again in the Victorian period by a Victorian artist um, that we have we have these particular engravings so these aren't in fact the original clothing book they're a Victorian reproduction of that of that book um, now there is also a another very useful source um, which I don't believe exists in kind of book form which is by the artist of that famous um, picture of the Battle of Culloden, Moria. Um, at the end of the War of the Austrian Succession, the Duke of Cumberland, who, who was the commander of the British Army by that time, um, commissioned Moria uh, to paint a hat man and a grenadier from all of the armies that he'd, all of the regiments of the army that he'd commanded um, I don't think Moriera actually ever finished the task 
but um, there are certainly other engravings that you do see in, in uh, reference books and so on that look very similar to this, but they are from a slightly later period. So this is 1742 and Moria's uh, sketches are from around 1750, 1751. Um, so to give you an example of that, which is in black and white, I'm afraid, but it, is, it does show you, um, this, is, this is a regimental history of the, four, the King's Own Royal Regiment, um, which was Barrel's regiment at the time of Culloden. So this is a regimental history of that particular reg regiment. And in here somewhere, so I should have marked the page. There it is. So this is Moriere's depiction of a grenadier from the 4th or King's Own Regiment. Um, and it says dressed according to the Royal Warrant of 1751 from a watercolour by F.W. Barry circa 1933 after an original by David Morier in the Royal Collection. So this is very similar um, process to the other one that um, except not in the Victorian era, but in the mid in the sort of between the interwar period in the 20th century, F.W. Barry uh reproduce these prints of moria so we're we're left with a lot of those as well um although this is in black and white this this was particularly useful to me um f for the details of the grenadiers mitre and i'm going to come on to that a little bit later um no in fact let's come on to it now um so these are grenadiers um, and I've painted them up, as I say, to represent Barrel's regiment. Now, this is another case in point of the figure manufacturer being a little bit stuck uh, because they have to depict some of the detail that's on the mitre um, and make it look fairly generic, whereas in fact, a lot of regiments had the grenadiers had different facings on the mitre cap. Um, the way that was determined was that a regiment could not only be a royal regiment or an, a regular regiment, um, so in this case we're dealing with a royal regiment that um, had blue trousers, but they could also be either a badged or an unbadged unit. And it's not royals are badged and non-royals are unbadged. You know, that varies as well. And it just so happens that Bowles regiment was a badged regiment. And that meant a bit like this mitre here, which is from the 8th Regiment, which was also a badge regiment, they would have a specific badge on the front of the Grenadiers mitre. Um, so it varies. Again, it's a regimental distinction. So this is unique to the 8th Regiment. And the King's Own had their own, uh, or rather Barrels at the time, had their own distinct uh, badge, which was a blue garter with the words on his swaki mali pants uh, which is the order of the garter motto around the around the badge um and this one this one has got a very similar motto on his swaki mali pants but it's got a white horse in the middle whereas uh, the um bowers regiment had gr in the middle of the blue garter um, so that is another thing that you have to research for every single regiment that you're doing at this at this time. Um, and luckily, again, that book, that article in Military Illustrated does tell you the badges for all the badged regiments. Um, all the Grenadiers, whether they were unbadged or unbadged, had this sort of red flap at the bottom of the front of the mitre. And it had... Um, the White Horse of Hanover on it, it was in red, <coughs> excuse me, it had the White Horse of Hanover and it had the motto Nec Aspera Terent, which means it's, it's sort of loosely just 
uh, translated as damn the difficulties um, but that was common to all regiments if a regiment was unbadged um, instead of a badge they would just have the royal cipher there which is a G and an R and that is the most common uh, design that you will find on sculpts from most ranges um, of figures not just the Krantara because um, it was the most common mot you know motif on the front of Grenadiers so they've gone for a sort of generic looking GR it's the easiest easiest thing to do um, but 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 you do get this whole issue about um, things are changing you know quite swiftly and 1745 isn't the precise date of either the clothing book of 1742 or uh, Moriere's prints and uh, this sketch here shows the 21st foot encamped at Roermond in Holland in 1748 so this is towards the end of the war of the Austrian succession and there are two grenadiers here both of whom are the 21st regiment but I think you can see that they have very different fronts to their mitre caps and that's because one of these I think this one is based on the clothing book of 1742 and by the time of Moriere's uh, sketches there is a different badge on the front um, and that is the badge that Osprey have chosen to depict here we go so this is a this is um, Osprey's version of it so this is meant to be Cumberland's Culloden army 7045 and they've decided that by the time of 7045 the badge had changed to that sort of white star like kind of uh, appearance so you know even with all that it's really valuable reference material you know that still survives there is still kind of there are still you know discussions and arguments going on about what you know what particular detail was actually prevalent at the time of, of Culloden and so on um, so that is more or less the Grenadiers but then we come on to um, the command stand now um, you probably spotted that the drummer has a mitre very similar to the grenadiers similar yes but not the same um, so i'll show you that plate i showed you earlier Where was it? which actually depicts the drama from bell's regiment and you can see here better better than my painting um that the drummer's mitre was shorter didn't have the tuft at the top and it doesn't have the same badge as the grenadiers in barrel's regiment had so although barrel's regiment was a badged regiment the design on the front of drummer's mitres was common throughout uh, the entire army um, in that it depicted these sort of trophies so two cross trophies and a pair of drums and so on so that was a common um, device I think I think as far as I know on all of the drummers uh, from this of the army from this period um, the difference though in terms of drummers from one regiment to another is that in most regiments the, the drummers and you'd be familiar with this if you've painted napoleonic figures um, the drummer would have reverse colors so their coat would be of the facing color and then the facings themselves would be red so you may be asking yourself then well in that case why isn't the drummer's coat blue rather than red and that is because there was an exception made in royal regiments 
that you didn't reverse the colours. So in royal regiments, they would have blue trousers, blue facings, um, and the drummer would have a red coat with blue facings. Um, if this was another regiment, say the buffs, it, the colours would be reversed, so it would be a buff coat with red facings. Um, so that's another thing that you have to kind of bear in mind, you know, that you, it's an easy mistake to make if you just make assumptions um, without actually, you know, referencing your painting. Um, so that's exactly the sort of thing I mean about if I'd made that mistake and like, um, you know, a year on, someone had sort of politely pointed it out to me, it still makes me kind of grind my teeth and think, oh no, I got it wrong, got it wrong. Um, yeah, and the other thing about this command stand, let's get this back again, sorry, is I wasn't quite sure about the lace for the officers because I knew it wasn't going to be white um, with any kind of pattern or design in it. Um, it was either going to be silver or gold. And um, I'd sort of naively assumed that maybe it was silver for the junior officers, gold for the senior, That's sort of assumption you might make. But no, um, every regiment had either gold or silver, not both. Um, and in the case of barrels, it, uh, it changed from being silver to gold at some time over this period. So um, some books now that tell you that it was gold, some tell you that it was silver. So I've gone for, I've gone for silver, but certainly by the Seven Years' War, it would have been gold. Um, so again, another another area that you can slip up on. Uh, another thing as well at the back of this, just thought of this while sort of holding it in my hand. Um, there's an officer holding a spontoon that I put there and he's got a sort of great coat on and all my instincts told me to paint that grey because in, certainly in the Napoleonic era it would have been grey and in fact um, I recently watched the film Revolution um, an interesting film not not the finest of films but worth watching um, and that's sort of set in the American War of Independence. And the costumes for that were the advisor, the sort of military costume advisor was our old friend John Mollo. Um, and the character played the sort of Sergeant Major villain played by Donald Sutherland um, in that. At one point is wearing an a army issue greatcoat with the kind of flap at the back and so on. And it's definitely grey in that, and I wasn't at all sure what to do because all the books that I was reading were saying it should be blue. Um, so in the end, I decided to paint it blue, and it may be a mistake, but um, there is a there is a character here wearing a very similar coat. This is in 1760, and it's definitely blue, and also that figure on Krantawa's website, there's a converted, a, a colour photo of a converted figure, uh, of, of a conversion of that figure into a Highland officer, and they've painted his coat blue. So I've decided to go with blue, um, but that might be wrong. Uh, in terms of things like sword knots for the officers and the flag finials and so on, I actually painted those gold, because that seemed more correct to me, but I'm wondering now whether maybe they should have been silver as well to conform with the blue, I'm oh, sorry, with the uh, silver lacing of the, of the, of the trims and so on. Um, anyway, I think that is the end of my, um, sort of story of my journey of discovery so far. Uh, certainly when I paint up my next unit, which I've began, began now, I'd God knows how long it's going to take me to finish it. Um, I'm, I'm certainly a lot more confident now about what I'm doing. Um, so I think a lot of the time that I spent on Bowers Regiment was down to kind of trying to get things right. But now, as I say, now I've got a sort of more confidence that I know what I'm doing. I should be able to turn the next one out a little bit more quickly, if not um, swiftly. So that's that's my um, 
story of my learning curve hope you enjoyed it and thanks for watching if indeed you still are <laughs> and see you on the next video bye for now